Good morning and welcome to Ready to Work powered by APSA. My name is Rev Eskin and today's interview, uh, pretty much today's session promises to be a very interesting one. I'm very excited about this one because it has a lot to do with things I'm very familiar with. Now the emergence of digital technologies um, has transformed how businesses and entrepreneurship work these days. You and I were attested the fact that distant communication content overload and of course big data are just a few of the many consequences of digitalization now with uh, which entrepreneurs need to cope today. Today entrepreneurs need to be aware that they can be disrupted not only by uh, not only uh, well but quite possibly not only by consumer interactions but also things that has to do with competition from other companies, other brands, due to how our digital space works now. Now, um, the manner with which businesses operate has been interrupted. You and I will uh, attest to the fact that internet and pretty much what the digital space offers has a lot to do with how companies thrive these days. Now, responding promptly to demands of continuous product innovation, one, providing added value services or value added services as we all call it, improving the customer experience and moving towards successful omni-channel marketing have become the new standards of doing business in the digital age. These changes in the use of tech have important implications in and on how we prepare our young people and young entrepreneurs for work and business environments at large. Our apps are ready to work today is on entrepreneurial skills and we will be discussing the topic harnessing entrepreneurial mindsets in this digital age and of course our panel uh, today is made up of great personalities people who are quite vested in this topic uh, the accomplished gentlemen who are going to share some insights and experiences on the topic so i will go straight to my first panelist um, the chief and government officer of APSA bank ghana in the person of ebo richardson my name's sick uh, Ebo is an experienced leader who has delivered people, digital and process transformations while holding various leadership roles uh, for a number of multinational companies, including Barclays, Millicom, Vodafone, Santander, KPMG, and PricewaterCoopers. In a career spanning almost 22 years. Uh, currently, APSA's Ghana's Chief Enablement and Information Officer, Ebo's motivation is ensuring optimal value for, uh, from technology and change-related investments and ensuring that the digital movement is fully optimized. He is passionate about people and people development and the use of technology to solve and uh, you know, improve social and commercial problems. 
in the immediate past, Ebo was the responsible uh, program director and accountable uh, executive for transitioning the then Barclays Bank Ghana to the new APSA Bank Ghana. I'm going straight to my second panelist who is with me here, Nana Jaman Prempe is his name, Chief Executive Officer, Grow For Me Limited. Nana is the high growth serial entrepreneur with experience in building businesses here in uh, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, and other countries. Equipped with an MPhil and bachelor's in Greek engineering and overseas, the vision and implementation of Grow For Me. Uh, he joins me in here. Oh, goodness, Grow For Me Ghana outfit. Guys, my third panelist, but just so we know who he is, um, he's known as Amea Debra, very, very famous person. Um, he's a founder of Amea Debra Media. Back in 2008, he launched his blog, ameadebra.com, which immediately became the home of celebrity and lifestyle content here in Ghana. Uh, over the years, Amea Debra has excelled in the online media space, winning awards all over the globe for his works. Um, he has successfully built a strong following on um, social media marketing, making him one of the most influential online personalities here in Ghana and across Africa. He also managed other online platforms, uh, Ghana Web, he's worked with Pulse Ghana, and even yen.com.gh, as well as Scooper News. Guys, good morning, and thanks for joining me in the studio today. You guys are looking good. Good morning. There's a lot of traffic in town, so for you guys to make it here on time, I'm going to have to, uh, you know, big you guys up. Um, I want to start with you, Ebo. Ebo, tell me a little bit about what you do. I mean, we spoke about you earlier read a lot about you but uh, maybe I left something out just let my viewers know what you do and why you're here this morning okay excellent thank you very much uh, Rev um, so I think I think your introduction really summarized it quite well in terms mm -hmm. of you know my profile and yeah. where I've come from and how come I'm, I'm, I'm here today uh, in it to, to summarize it further in terms of what I do now I'm the guy at APSA who uh, has to take our digital offerings to the next level. So mm. basically, you know, that is, in a nutshell, that is what I have to do. Uh, we, are, we are currently where we believe we need to be, mm. but we also recognize with the world changing so fast that we have to take things up a couple of notches, mm. and it's my job to make sure that that happens. Wow, that's very beautiful. Nanajima, let's hear from you as well. What do you do? Yeah, so piggyback from where I go, he's the guy I look up to say I want to be like him. <laughs> yeah, but basically, I'm a serial tech entrepreneur. I'm a two-time tech founder. My mm. current company is called Grow For Me. And simply what we do is that everyone mm. from yourself yeah. should be a farmer. So from the comfort of your chair on your tablet, you can actually start a one-acre maize farm in Ghana or Everything a rice farm from right from your tablet. Wow or your phone, or probably your smartwatch. <laughs> so um, basically what we've done at Grow For Me is to allow every single individual mm. to play in the space of food production. Great. We are going to about 2.5 billion size continent by 2030. But we're still struggling to feed our 1.6, 1.8 billion population. And no government alone or donor will be capable of solving this problem except every single person gets his hands on deck, finances the industry to grow more. And our job is to bring that technology that yeah. connects you to the farmer and the farmer's harvest to the market. Wow, sounds good. So guys, if you're watching us on Zoom, on YouTube or Facebook, you have a question for any of my panelists in the course of the conversation. If you want to add anything, make sure you put the questions in the comment box. We'll definitely make time for you to make it happen. Now, we are in a digitized space. We're all here because the digital world is constantly advancing. Uh, let me just take us back a year ago when COVID hit. We all woke up one day and a pandemic had stopped everything. Um, I'm sure you guys prepared for a few of these things in the future, but then at large, do you think the entrepreneurial scene, Ghana at large, was ready for what happened, how we reacted to um, how things had to be paused? Did we do well? Well, uh, Rev, in my view, I think we did well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think how well we did was almost coincidental in my view. Yeah. Um, Going digital and trying to, you know, realize the benefits of digital is something that has been happening for years. Yes. It is not new, uh, and it certainly was not uh, predicated by COVID. However, in this part of the world, because of our some of our cultural norms and nuances, mm -hmm. we tend to like, 
you know, some of the physical elements. We tend to have very intimate relationships, for instance, with cash, yeah, right? So, um, you know, these things were moving along steadily but slowly, mm -hmm. and then COVID hit. And I think COVID brought with it a realization yeah. that if you know, certain things or some of the norms change, or there were some constraints or restraints that were imposed, if we didn't change the way we did things, then we would found wanting. Mm -hmm. And I think that realization acted as a catalyst which pushed things along so all of a sudden you know people sat up uh, i was uh, i was with uh, kojo uh, boating uh, at uh, city fm a couple of days ago and he was you know spouting some very interesting numbers when you look at the growth in across various industries yep. uh, over the uh, the last year we've had the pandemic it's phenomenal you know and you would have thought it wasn't expected yep. but i think what Ghanaians did was to respond quickly. Mm, respond quickly. And on the field of entrepreneurship for your brand, I mean, you mentioned something very interesting a few minutes ago, the fact that now, thanks to your company and the awareness you're creating, I can pretty much just sit here and not have to go all the way to my farm to handle things. Uh, was this something you were running way before COVID hit? When it hits, how did it affect your business? Yes, absolutely. Um, my first company was a church tech company which okay. provides payment for churches. I'm sorry okay. about and we saw a 3x growth on that. The interesting thing is, we have been building a, a growth for me like three years ago on stealth. And last year, 16th of January, we actually launched the company. And that was exactly when COVID was actually taken. Yeah. And on, our operations began on June um, of last year. That was in the heat of it. Mm -hmm. So actually, in the heat of COVID, we had now, at the right point, we're going out to that platform. And it's amazing to know that within that six-month frame, we had raised over 100,000 wow. to sponsor dollars, not CDs, wow. to sponsor 200 plus farmers. Why? People realize that when COVID struck, even when everything comes to a standstill, you need two things. You need your food and you need your toilet roll. So people understood that, look, if there's nothing at all I could do, I can fund food production. Mm -hmm. And we saw an amazing uptake of our platform. So yes, it, it preceded um, COVID, but officially when we started operation, it happened right in the center of the pandemic. And what COVID did was it basically accelerated growth. It made your pitch easier. People understood yeah. the value of technology in whatever space. Mm -hmm. And they both said that we have a very strong adaption to cash. Yes, we do. But for the very first time when COVID struck, we were able to start deploying cash to rural communities for the commodity that we aggregate yeah. using digital technology. And I must say, um, there were good sides to COVID, but COVID is never a good yeah. thing. So, yeah. Wow, beautiful. And so the main motive behind this conversation is to find um, ways through which our viewers, young entrepreneurs alike, can fit in, how they can amplify ways through which they offer services, ways through which they push their companies, they make their brands competitive with other brands through digital means. Yeah. And so I just want to find out, I mean, before all this came up, before Ibo landed position he has now, before grew for me, um, what were you guys doing? And how did you land in this career? Is this something you wanted to do uh, initially or it's a product of chance? Yeah, so I, I started off as a young person, um, very, very early, wanting to be a farmer. Okay. However, when I saw my father in his white epaulette, he was a flight attendant at Ghana Airways. I mean, he used to travel with him, it was fun. <laughs> I was like, I think I have interesting aviation. Okay. And then I saw um, our former president, Jerry John Rollins, <laughs> beloved in memory, and I saw and I read about him in the fighter jet. I was like, I want to be a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. So from class three all the way to secondary school in Akosoma International, all my classmates knew I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Wow. But then it's interesting how actually get exposed things here. So that's where I was. But as I transitioned from actually almost entering into the academy and going to get my degree in the university, I had a very critical conversation with my brother, who then was working with the bank. And he said that, you see, I mean, that was about almost 15 years ago. He said, if you want to focus on anything, focus on technology. In other sense, computers, that's how they used to call it. Because mm. that's going to rule the world. Mm. And that's what you should align with. Mm. So even though I was studying agric engineering, I started actively doubling into technology and right after my bachelor's I enrolled in Meltwater Entrepreneur School of Technology and that really gave me my foundation yeah. into technology. Yeah. I learned how to write software, mm. understood the impact of software 
and I was very positioned and poised for the tech industry. So relatively, my experience has been very structured. I had to learn in a structured environment. Then after, thrust out there into the business world with four other co-founders to found our first company. And that's basically how I got into the tech space. So people have different journeys. Yeah. So to someone listening, you may not have to go through a meltwater have yeah, a conversation, yeah. but you may probably be exposed on your phone to software, to a mobile app, and that could be your first journey to you know, technology. And that's my story. That's how I got into it. Beautiful story. Well, I mean, I say this for a fact, uh, maybe for a lot of you guys, the journey starts today. With what you're going to hear on the show today, you definitely know that you might not have to go through meltwater like you said, but maybe you definitely have to start on your phone here and then make progress into that. You are a people person. You know, that <laughs> says that. Um, how, how, do you, how do you cope with all kinds of people, especially in uh, implementing the things that you know, the changes that you know in the digitized space? Are people welcoming uh, the, the, the new innovations in the digitized space, how entrepreneurship work, uh, all the changes that have come up? Thanks to technology. Thank you very much for that question. I think, uh, I think it's an important one. I think it's a really pertinent one. Now, um, for me, even though um, one of the words that have been used to describe me for you know, close to 30 years is, uh, is I'm a technologist, uh, I like to see myself first and foremost as a people person. And the reason for this is because ultimately, regardless of what we do, regardless of what endeavors we're involved in, it all comes down to people. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to further humanity and, 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 and bring about progress that will ensure all our lives are, are better as a result. So um, when you talk about this whole digital uh, movement, which some, sometimes I like to call it that, and how people take to it, you realize that you know, the psychology of human beings is an interesting thing that you very, need to work with. Yeah. And people tend to have fears and, and reservations, and that makes us a little resistant to change. You know, we, we kind of want to stick to what we know mm -hmm. because it's safer. So when these new elements are coming into play, uh, you have to find very uh, amenable ways to get people to embrace them. And once they embrace them and they feel the positivity and the benefits that come with it, then they tend to yeah. you know, want to go along yeah. for the ride. Um, we, we've banded around this, this terminology, digital transformation. It's actually one of the things I have to do uh, for, for a number of years now. And digital transformation is key because we're moving from one traditional world into a more sort of yeah. new age, yeah. you know, new experiences type world. And that journey is what we call the digital transformation. But I find, in my humble opinion, that the most important and powerful digital transformation is the one that yes. happens here, yes. the mindset. Uh, mindset is everything, as they say, and if you don't make that, that journey in your own mind to embrace the new and to optimize so that you can get the, the best out of it, then you may find that you're, you're lagging behind somewhat. And I think that is one of the things that whether you're a large organization yeah. like APSA or whether you're an entrepreneur, an SME, that is one of the things that you always have to be mindful of. You know, that mindset, both in terms of your internal operations, how do your own people see it, how do they embrace it, how do they apply it, but also the external, yeah. the, 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 your, your constituents, your stakeholders, your customers, how do they see it? And do they understand that this is for their good? Yeah. Once you can bring that into play, then you can make some positive impact. Mm, that's beautiful. Anyway, so we're moving on straight to you, um, Ajuman. And Ajuman, so I want to find out, I mean, you have been in this entrepreneurial field forever. Um, what are some of the most critical challenges you met in the journey of being an entrepreneur? And then second question, what are some of the most critical changes you think young entrepreneurs are like, uh, should make in, um, well, in terms of the future, how things may change? Last year, COVID came. Who knows what may happen in the near future? What are some of the changes they should make now in order to be fit to face the future whatsoever may come up? And what are the challenges you faced in your journey? Yeah, this is a very important question I need to set out to answer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you. It's, it's at the heart of entrepreneurship. And I'll try and be very generalistic mm -hmm. because sometimes in telling one's story, um, it tends to make other people feel that they may not have to experience yeah. it. I'm going to be very generalistic. So um, I can speak to entrepreneurship in Ghana, Nigeria, then South Africa and a little bit around Kenya because I've operated in those places. 
generally in the tech space, and I, I want to speak tech because that's where I focused, yeah. and maybe I agree. In the tech space, there are a couple of challenges um, that you would face. First of all, when you start playing in the tech space, you realize you're not playing locally, you're playing on an international level. Mm -hmm. Once you start providing tech solutions, you're playing on an international level because to your very first point, your competitor is out there in Silicon Valley in Russia, yeah. providing yeah. an equivalent solution yeah. that can is probably less priced, more efficient. More efficient yeah. So once you step into tech, you have to start looking at things from a very international perspective. And that's one of the challenges we had because we were building a local product that was going to play on an international space. And we realized that quality, excellence could not be compromised. Yeah. I remember we had been on, on one of my companies had been featured on CNN and right after the, you know, you could, I mean, when CNN features, you go on all kinds of places, yeah. even on aircrafts, you could watch it. And what we ha happened was you could see people from across the world sign up on our platform and giving feedback about some little thing that wasn't working. And that was, that was not too exciting. So you have to first of all realize that you have to step up your game. Secondly is data. And it may seem trivial, but I want to highlight it. So if it's going to take you maybe five seconds to get a page to load, mm -hmm. and it's going to take someone in the US a millisecond to load the same page, he's literally, he's, you're literally five seconds behind. behind yes. So you need to put in extra effort to play at the same level that these guys would play. Yeah. Next is another challenge was financing. So at a, as a startup or as an entrepreneur in, in Africa, you're not going to have easy financing come to you that quickly. Mm -hmm. So from day one, you have to build a business that the unit economics, when I say unit economics, your cost, your profit, your cost, your selling price, you must make a yeah. profit from day one. Otherwise, you become an unattractive solution for many people to invest in because you don't have that flexibility. So these are the kind of, just a few challenges that generally I've seen mm -hmm. abroad. The last one I'll say was skill. It's quite difficult getting the kind of skill that you need to build global platforms. So what you have to really invest in is in your team, exposing them to people who have the right skills. So one of the things we did in our first company was to really connect with Ebo and Steam to learn what it means to play on an international level. But going forward to your second question, things that those who are stepping into the space now should look out for is to really be open to learning. Mm. Learning and information is no longer restricted to a few. It's out there. A single search on YouTube can give you any information you want, from how to plant a, a corn seed to how to build a space shuttle. You will find it out there on YouTube mm. or on the internet. Mm. So you must actually turn your mobile device into your library. Yeah. If you do not use your mobile device as a learning tool, you will not get far. And finally, you have to begin to understand the new technologies that are out there because they are coming. How is AI going to impact you? What is going to be the value for you? You have to understand when you hear the term FinTech, what is it and how do you benefit from that space? So you should not just take things from a user's perspective. Yeah. If you're going to be successful as an entrepreneur, you have to begin to go beyond what users do and learn so that you can deal with the challenges, the new challenges that are going to come as you build your company as a young entrepreneur. Thank you so much for that. And well, let me come back to you. Um, you have been dealing with entrepreneurs the ones coming up, the ones who are already in the business for a while. When you interact with them, what are some of the common, most common misconceptions they have about the whole enterprise, especially around this digital space? I'll come back to you, uh, Nanajman, on the same question. Yeah. Sure. Um, Reverend, I think the, the, the sort of misconceptions that yes. uh, entrepreneurs tend to have, particularly young entrepreneurs uh, who may not necessarily have a a serial track record behind them like Nanandas, um, <laughs> even though he's still young, um, is, is a sense of sort of ease or a misplaced sense of mm. ease, if mm. I, can, I, I can put it that way. Um, just because you've seen Nana do it yeah. and do it well yeah. does not mean it's easy. Mm. There's a lot that goes into making you know, these things work. As an entrepreneur, uh, there are some character traits that I believe you need to have if you're going to make uh, a success of your track record 
Uh, passion is a critical one. You have to have passion for what it, you seek to do. Mm -hmm. uh, persistence, because there will be very, very difficult times along yeah. the way, and you need to break through those walls. Uh, and also, relationship management. One of the key skills an entrepreneur brings to the table is the ability to bring people together mm -hmm. to solve mm -hmm. particular problems. And you know, business, as uh, Paul Marsden says, business is is essentially you know just all about solving problems, people's yeah. problems. Yeah at a profit yeah. and in order to be able to do that you have to identify the right opportunities and then be able to you know provide the solutions or exploit the opportunities uh, you know to, to 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 be able to create value so that sort of misconception of oh you know it's easy digital is there you'll be able to do xyz and hey presto you know you're raking it in <laughs> um is is one of the things that we need to dispel that said if you are the right sort of personality and you have you know, the drive, the purpose, you know what it is that you want to do, then some of these challenges, uh, you know, you will, you will surmount them. Yeah. And if you seek advice, and that's one of the things that I'd like to throw in as well, is that the fact that you have that passion and that energy does not mean that you know all. That's true. Right? There are people who have been through this, been through that, who can give you powerful insights that will help you drive uh, the agenda that you have. And I think that's also one of the pieces of ad advice I will throw in. Great. No, no. Misconceptions. Yeah. So, first of all, let me lay a foundation. A lot of young entrepreneurs stepping into the tech space read from a lot of tech blogs like TechCrunch and the rest, listen to a lot of TED Talks, and it gives you a, a certain impression that you hit the ground running and you can go. And you can easily attract capital. The customers will flow in. That actually creates a big problem. Yeah. Because what happens is that you, you're building your business within a context, within an ecosystem, within a culture, within a, a place which has a certain behavior. And you need to understand the social and cultural context yeah. within which you are building your business. So to be a, to a both point, one of the misconceptions is people think they don't need anyone, mm -hmm. they can build it and will grow. Secondly, they think that once they put a platform out there, people will just chip in. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of... Um, idealistic perception about you would get investment overnight. As a matter of fact, for example, even in the fintech space, you cannot just get up and start building a fintech solution because you have the skill. There's regulation, there's legislation, there's money involved. So it's become a bit much more complicated than it is first. So when, when you want to do anything now, mm -hmm. once again, this device comes back. You have to research. Yeah. And I'll just use a simple analogy. When the screens behind us look very nice, it looks like you can just get a screen and put it there. But when you go behind it, there's a lot of mechanisms at play, a lot of wiring, a lot of connections. And that's how complicated it is. So there is a lot of misconceptions, but I think conversations like this yeah. and experienced people like Abo help the like exactly yeah. help demystify mm -hmm. it and allows you to connect and learn from people who are in the trenches actually dealing with the business itself. Great, beautiful. I'm, I'm really loving this conversation, guys. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a question for us, make sure you drop it in the comment box. We're going to find time and then get into that. My third panelist will be joining me on here uh, very, very soon. I think he's quite uh, experienced when it comes to social media. We've discussed a lot around how to get into the digital space, how to enhance your entrepreneurial skills with uh, you know, the digital trends and all that. But uh, social media has been left out. I was going to get to that, but I definitely want to find out from uh, you know, our third panelist in a bit on that. What practical advice Abel, would you give to entrepreneurs? I mean, we've shared a few, mm -hmm. but practically, if somebody is out there right now, the person has a business solution, the person has identified a problem that they would want to solve. The person wants to break away from the traditional you know, work system and then come into the stream of entrepreneurship. What do they have to know? What advice would you give them? Well, I think the, 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 first, the very first one is something that both Nana and I have, have alluded to uh, you know, in our submissions, which is you know, seek the right people that yeah. can guide you. For me, uh, in spite of energy, in spite of passion, in spite of even skills, there is no substitute for experience. Mm. And it is that experience that will tell you where all the potholes and all the pitfalls are yeah. that you can avoid. Mm. So number one is, yes, you have that drive. Yes, you've identified a problem uh, that, uh, that you'd like to solve. And that's fantastic. You know, this world is full of problems and we all need to figure out ways to solve them. However, you know, what are you know, the, the right tenets? 
for instance, is the approach the right approach? Will the approach connect to other stakeholders? Yeah. You know, are there regulations you need to be mindful of that you don't fall foul of? All of these things are important. I think once you have that, then then you can you can be on your way. So for, number one for me would be you know seek the right sort of advice. Uh, number two is to define mm. you know your 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 service or solution architecture. Mm. Now, because I'm I'm a technologist, when I speak of architecture, yeah. people automatically think <laughs> it's about you know the the technical mm -hmm. connections mm -hmm. of this wire and that wire and, and a lot of the times when I speak it is. But in this context, <laughs> it's more about you know that framework, framework that you're going yes. to use. Yes. Right? So that framework then says if I'm solving the problem what are the actors? What's the process? Mm. What's the benefits? How can I articulate the benefits? You need to map all of that out. Because I think a lot of the times, you know, people just get up, hey, presto, and, you know, they're gone and they're trying to do things. And there is something to be said for spontaneity That's and energy. True. There is something to be said for that. But at a point in time, what will take you uh, further is discipline and structure mm. and you need the right framework in order to be able to drive that so for me you know those are two practical things i think and i believe firmly that entrepreneurs uh you know need to be mindful of as they begin and traverse these very important journeys all right thank you so much guys you're still watching ready to work powered by apsa that's africanacity the conversation continues right after these messages to work now we're super privileged to have our third panelist in here with us Amel Debra and we've introduced him already I feel I'm a, a bit more uh, you know committed to finding out what he has to serve us today because the space is basically like the main thing now social media mm -hmm. everybody has a piece to say um, you are an entrepreneur I mean before you launched AmelDebra.com you had another job. I mean, you're pretty much working for somebody before you branched into that. How has the journey been so far? So, uh, it's been quite interesting because the timelines for me are very, uh, what's the word for it? Sometimes luck is also part of yeah. it. Um, so, at a point when I was working with Ovation, I decided to sort of look online mm -hmm. for opportunities. And so, I got some things coming my way. And one of them was working with the Voices of Africa in yeah. Netherlands. Uh, and that project and my work there now also got people from Ghana Web looking yeah. at me. And so they also hired me to become a content editor for them. And although I was working with them, I still had that room to be very free because I was working yeah. from 
from home virtually at that very early stage. And up, to, up, up until the point when I now launched uh, amiadeva.com. And the funny thing is, uh, the owner of Ghana Web, who is Dutch also, for some time, for the very first time, came to Ghana. Yeah. And around the time when he was here, uh, he heard on radio uh, events, uh, media partner, Amir Debra, and he got worried. He's like, uh, so this Amir Debra thing is so big. Yeah. And for him, he wanted it to be uh, Ghana Web on all of these platforms. So the first challenge came when uh, I had to make the decision to really leave Ghana Web yeah. and then pursue what I was starting, uh, which was my passion, which was sort of buzzing, but not e exactly making me mm -hmm. revenue. Uh, so that challenge came, but I took that difficult decision to uh, rather forego that uh, salary and then go into the world of the unknown to pursue something that was mine. Yeah. And so it took time to build uh, it on my own based on whatever traction I had created, uh, particularly via social media because I got in very early and mm -hmm. made sure that I was relevant uh, across platform to sustain whatever idea I wanted to do. And so I wasn't, I wasn't so sure what was happening, yeah. what I was getting into, but I was sort of motivated and encouraged that you have this voice that people believe. Mm -hmm. And so I use that to now take, uh, go on a journey which has brought me this far so far. Wow, great. Mm -hmm. Such a beautiful story with that. Uh, I'm still on you today. Social media is now a huge thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I say now a huge thing because way back, a lot of the business avenues that are now mm -hmm. uh, didn't really exist. Are entrepreneurs taking social media really serious, critically? Well, yes, I think they are. And on different levels, you realize that uh, depending on what kind of work you're doing, some people, uh, their biggest sort of client or market come from, from say, Instagram. Yeah. Uh, because those platforms, and I, I keep telling people to understand the various platforms and what you can do with it, because what you can achieve from Facebook is not the same as what you can I achieve uh, with Twitter, for instance. So you must have an understanding of all of these platforms and how you want to use it uh, to your benefit. I, I'd say, by and large, uh, those who know uh, what they want uh, sort of using social media and those who don't are also uh, finding ways to uh, to use it. And I mean, my space where I depend more on uh, digital marketing, yeah. advertising from brands and companies, I realize that even they are now having an understanding of wanting to go into that space. And particularly, I see it, some sort of a surge during this COVID period. Yeah. And uh, over the years, I've been complaining that if the ecosystem is going to sustain itself and it becomes business for lots of people in the space that I find myself, it's important that businesses also get on board mm. and are able to connect uh, with the right people to sort of market them. And I see a lot of that happening. And uh, I think that's the, one of the positives out of the COVID yeah. uh, thing. I just want to see how it progresses uh, here, hereafter. Mm, great. Now, so we've shared so much about what people need to look out for. I mean, before you came in, um, Nanajman shared a lot on what entrepreneurs who are looking forward to getting straight into the business should look out for. Um, Ebo also shared his professional experience with us on how entrepreneurs see the changes in the digitized space and that. But to Nanajman and then, of course, uh, Ameao, you guys are in a competitive field. I say competitive field because there are people who are offering similar services. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of social media experts, people who have other blogs that are doing equally well. Mm -hmm. What makes you people stand out? And of that, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs in offering services and being special in what they do? Will you go first? Uh, I think, I think <laughs> Nanash, Nanash should go. Yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> so um, I kindly play in a space called the agri-tech space, okay. agricultural technology. Mm -hmm. And what makes us stand out is three main things. Mm -hmm. Number one, in our slogan, everyone can farm, the first word is everyone. Mm -hmm. We are really focused on everyone. So we built our technology such that everyone, whether you are a literate who has a smartphone and can go online, yeah. or you just have a YAM, a feature phone, and you can dial star 800, star 008 mm -hmm. hash mm -hmm. to start a farm. So we are very big on everyone. Mm -hmm. Number two is accessibility. So what we've done is actually to make it possible for every agricultural company, every farmer, 
or every off-taker mm. to come on our platform, raise funding, yeah. and also to trade. So we, we've not built a technology exclusively for growth for me and our immediate connections or partners. But any farmer who wants to say today, raise patient capital and profit share instead of interest as a different model, can come on growth for me, say I want to fund um, um, soybean and raise money through his network on wow. one platform, then farm and through the same platform, pay back sponsors. And the third one is market. So at the end of it, when you've raised money and you've gotten everyone to fund and everyone can farm, you really need someone to buy your product. And what we've done is to put a marketplace once again on an offline and an online platform that allows anyone who wants to buy at wholesale level. I'm not talking about yeah. one bag of rice, I'm talking yeah. about maybe 50 metric tons of rice or maize to do so with a simple tap on his phone. And this is unique, this is unheard of. And where we are now is to literally raise investment and scale this so that yep. everyone, a mayor, you can start your own farm and call it a mayor's farm, or a farmer in Wenchi can now have funding from a mayor to do an extra acre. And maybe Rienko or Olam, who needs maybe 50 metric yep. tons of maize or something, can simply buy from a platform like this. And I think that's what makes us unique, even though um, we have other companies doing the similar thing. But I must add that. In the agriculture space, I don't think it's about competition because the real enemy and the real problem you're trying to solve is hunger. Mm. And when you have a big problem like that, anyone who is doing such a similar thing is a partner. So I see all other people in the similar space as partners, not really as competitors. That's wow, that's a beautiful mindset. Amel. Well, for me, what makes me unique, I think from the beginning, it's uh, being able to have my voice. Uh, I think I built uh, a brand that sort of reflects me. My name is on my website, everything I do is me. So that thinking that I want people to connect with me and even when I'm doing some sort of influencing for people, I always try to put myself in there. So I think that's what uh, sets me apart from uh, most of the people in the field that I am in. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it, it, it goes on to every other entrepreneur. It's important for you to find that then that makes you unique and work on it so that you sort of uh, make it clear what your offering is from the next person. Uh, it, 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 we are in a world where pretty much everything is being replicated and it's difficult to find that uniqueness, yeah. but sometimes it's even your customer service, the, the feedback you give to yeah, somebody, uh, how you take feedback and react with your people, that will set you apart. So uh, it's important to find those little things that uh, would make somebody come to you instead of the next person. All right, so great. Thank you for sharing that with us. But let me just pick off the final words you said to find out the little things that would make somebody come to you mm -hmm. instead of the next person. Give me three don'ts <laughs> um, for entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs, the ones who want to get mm -hmm. into the field. When it comes to social media, three things they shouldn't do. Three key things they shouldn't do. Well, the easiest thing I'd say is don't do something that, don't put something that you know will come back to haunt you. I mean, you know the brand you're building, the business you're building, yeah. and you should be, it should be clear yeah. in your mind that you can do something that will be detrimental to what it is you're doing, yeah. and stay off of that. Uh, don't make unnecessary enemies, <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially on social media, because People may have the wrong perception of whatever True. it is based on something that has gone out. So, uh, 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 yes, and don't, what else should I say? <laughs> uh, I, I, sorry to interrupt you, but I get one thing, right? Um, I share this with entrepreneurs out there. It seems, I mean, from my point of view or where I sit, it seems people are not really happy or pleased when they see DM for prizes, all mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. um, you're clearly advertising whatever yeah, product that you yeah, have. Yeah. I feel we're in a space where things should be fast-tracked mm -hmm. so much that yeah. you don't have to take me through the stress exactly. of having to reach you, especially I, I, when you're not unreachable. I absolutely like, to get, I, I yeah. agree to that. I've, I've sold some cars online, and to be honest, the ones that come with the prizes already sort of get move faster because yeah. they already know what to expect and whether they're interested or not. Yeah. And the feedback has been that those ones always go. But for those who want to DM for prize. DM me, let's negotiate. People don't know what to expect. But when, once the price is there, they know whether it's within yeah. uh, their means and then mm. they express interest or not rather than 
wasting so much time. So I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, sometimes they also want to hide it for fear of co competitors and all of that. <laughs> and so they want to hide some of these things. But I mean, uh, yes, I agree with you. All right. So um, at this point, we're going to move on straight to uh, my viewers, the ones that are watching on our YouTube uh, on the APSA Ready to Work platform, the ones watching on Zoom and then Facebook. If you have a question, this is the time we get into business. A message in here from an anonymous attendee says, as a passionate aspiring entrepreneur without ideas, how do I find myself successful in the business world? I think Ebo can, Sorry, as, uh -huh. as a passionate aspiring entrepreneur without ideas. Without? Yes, without ideas. Okay. Uh, how do I find myself successful in the business world? I said this to you because you mentioned passion along the line. Yeah. The passion itself is not okay. enough. So I find, I find it uh, very interesting, mm. uh, Reverend, that uh, you know, this uh, budding, uh, aspiring uh, entrepreneur yeah. Uh, has no ideas because I think uh, part of the journey of being an entrepreneur is precisely that you have an idea, right? Um, so I find that quite interesting. But I would say that if this person has energy and, and passion, uh, then it means that they, they, they are well primed uh, to find a problem to solve. And as I said earlier on, you know, this world is full of problems. Uh, I don't think we'll ever solve all of them until Jesus comes, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, we, are, we are going along solving those that we can. And I think if you have the energy and the, the willingness to, to channel that energy into something, then there are you know, numerous ways in which you can do that. Yeah. The first thing is to find you know, what are those opportunities that I can exploit you know, to, to serve humanity, to solve social, commercial problems, but at the same time you know, to, 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 to create value and, and maybe you know, make money for myself as well. I think if you can answer that, then the rest of the process then, then takes effect. You know, how do you define the framework? How do you seek, uh, you know, those those advice from people who have been in the trenches? To, to borrow Nana's words earlier on, but also, how do you find the right partner, right? And and I think you know the partnership one is, is one I didn't mention earlier on, but I think it's it's, it's equally important as those points that have been uh, uh, submitted earlier on, which is, you know, for instance. If you take, uh, and, and you know, uh, APSA Startup is one of the things that we were making a lot of noise about a few months ago. The whole idea behind that is you're young or you know, you're, you're fresh, you have an entrepreneurial spirit and some ideas, you're setting up and you want somebody who has the right structures to help you along and take you on that journey. Uh, if you can find that, then that will be excellent. Because for instance, payments, uh, something I was talking about uh, a couple of days ago, payments is, is one of those things that you would need because we're exchanging monetary value, whether it's electronic value or you know, actual monetary value, we're exchanging that. That is the exchange, which you know, was established years ago, which later became cash. Yeah. Um, that exchange is, is moving into cyberspace, it's moving into the digital world. You need a partner that can help you traverse that as well. Yeah. So I think for me, you know, that's the, 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 uh, the, the advice that I would give to, to that person. And if they want to come and talk to Nana in person, I can, <laughs> I can fix it. You can fix <laughs> it. I can arrange it, I can make that happen. Anyway, so this is a quick follow-up, and I don't know, it goes to all of us. Uh, with all that um, Abu just said, and with regards to what the person asked, do you think it's a dangerous idea to be motivated by the fact that you think you have the passion to set up a, your own trend of the traditional business you're in? Let's say you work with a bank and you feel you can survive on your own. You have the zeal to be able to do what a mayor or Nana is doing without an idea to be motivated by that because you mentioned that the zeal itself is fine, but then you need to go into finding an idea for a solution you have or a problem you want to solve. Is it not a dangerous thing to be motivated by just the fact that you want to maybe leave your work yeah. or because you don't want to take orders for somebody to start your own business or to go into the, the stream of entrepreneurship? I, I, Reverend, I think, I think it could potentially be dangerous, mm. potentially, if it's aimless, mm. right? Because then, then you're, you're going nowhere. Mm. So uh, you're using a lot of energy, but you're driving into a ditch, mm. as it were. Uh, but if you can find the aim, yeah. then that energy can be channeled into something very productive, not just for yourself, but for communities. Mm. Uh, you know, I say this because I feel that sometimes people have this uh, almost instinctive sense that they can do better yeah and if you truly believe that so if 
For instance, you think that uh, you know what I'm doing at APSA and uh, my digital app, which I think is fantastic. If you think that you can do better, then you know you should try. You try. should at least take okay. that journey because you know I, I said earlier on the world is full of problems and mm. people buy need. People yeah. buy solutions mm. to the need in their lives. Mm. And if you can identify you know, those kind of gaps there is something here that people need that is not being done or is being done but is not being done well enough and mm. I can find ways to yeah. do it that well, then, then there's a clear opportunity which can be exploited to create value. I, I believe that. So I think, okay. I think it's about finding the channels, yeah. the right channels, the yeah. right objectives the for that passion mm. and for that energy. Mm. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, a message in here from Samuel Akotute says, my question is, as the panelists mentioned, uh, that one of the uh, main challenges every young entrepreneur is likely to face is the difficulty in raising a startup capital. Are there venues or avenues or schemes to finance uh, supporting uh, or to support such individuals? I think, um, Nana, you are in there. Yeah, so I think one of the challenges, you asked a question earlier on what are some of the challenges, and I said raising funds mm. is going to be one of the challenges. Mm. <laughs> but I think that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs really their biggest issue is not funding, funding. at a stage, at mm. a, cer a certain mm. stage. At the very early stage, your issue is not funding. Mm. Your, at the very early stage, your issue is really understanding mm. problem, solution, value creation, and yeah. what profit you can make. And um, if, you don't, if you've not been able to nail that, uh, you, your biggest issue is not funding. And typically, I advise many um, young entrepreneurs to look out for what you call a business model canvas. Okay and build your business on one sheet of paper. Until your business can fit one sheet of paper, you just don't have a business. Mm. So you put it on a one single sheet of paper, on what we call a business model canvas. Then once you start running the business and it's working, you can look for capital. But just to answer him directly, so um, a couple of places you can raise money. We, um, friends and family. Friends and family is your very first source of um, you know, income. And before I, I want to actually say something to that, typically I encourage anybody who thinks he has a passion but he just doesn't have an idea to start working mm -hmm. work with a company first yeah. and then understand what it takes to run a business mm -hmm. and once you've understood the complexity and the structure that Bo was talking about then you can actually build a very good company because passion or energy is like the um, uh, petrol putting petrol on yeah. fire yeah. but petrol on fire can just burn Mm -hmm. But when you put petrol in a combustion engine and you ignite it, it moves a vehicle. Mm. And that vehicle can travel from here to wherever, Addis Ababa, because the passion is controlled, it's placed within a structure that transmits that energy into the wheel. Likewise, many young entrepreneurs are like petrol, yeah. but you need that energy to be placed in a structure. Mm -hmm. So when you've not figured out where the destination is, get into an engine. An engine is another company. Understand the various moving parts. Understand how it works. And then when you come out still with that petrol, that passion, you can pro properly build a company. And then when you go to an investor, like a bank, that's a second source of income. Yeah. Or you go to a bank, then you can have a very compelling, clear business case for why you need 100,000 or 250. And let me end by saying, even in our space, even though we fund farmers, we don't fund fresh farmers. We don't fund someone who says, I want to start a farm today. You should have farmed for at least three years. You should have been in a particular community for at least three years. And you should have traded or sold that commodity to an off-taker and understand that farming business before we even give you a, something as low as even 2,000 CDs. So to his question, friends and family, banks, investors, and also your customers. And that's what I'll end with. Your customers can be your investors. How do you get it done? There's something called customer-funded businesses. So what you do is that, okay, now I need you to build me maybe um, a unique fundraising platform for my people in my village. I'll say, okay, you know what, I'll do it for you. But you have to pay half of it because I'm going to customize it. That half payment you're paying ahead of time is what I'm going to use to build a business, recruit extra people. And after we are done building, you pay me the next half. If you pay me ahead of time, it's evidence that my solution is actually valuable. So the last source of funding that a lot of people have not explored is customer-funded fi financing. Mm. So go to your customers, let them pay for it if it's that important, and then deliver the value to them. Great. Um, thank you so much. I think that is well answered. Uh, just add, uh, sure, go ahead. One, no um, problem. suggestion no that problem. I would throw in. I think Nana uh, dealt with that question expertly, you know, pure mastery. Uh, but incubator programs I find are also helpful because what they do 
is to not only give you kind of your, your startup, your support mm. structures, those initial mm. uh, uh, steps that you need to take, but they also create a, a, a framework that gives you some business yes. skills and, yeah. and, and knowledge and, and I think I would recommend that also for, for those uh, those people that are looking to, to, to do that. Nana is a, is a product of one so APSA has been a very instrumental part very, of our first company yeah. I'm sorry but uh, through APSA and the relationship we built we've not only built a global technology platform in Asoya, but we are exposed to business in multiple countries, and that's added to my value. Yeah. So I think the incubator programs are very, very important. There are a number of them. Yeah. APSAS, um, ex ongoing startup program, there's GIZ, there's Meltwater, there's um, Accra Digital Center, numerous, no, so many of them. Just go back on your phone. and on the phone again. Yeah. Now that's why it's very particular <laughs> about going back on the phone. But just to add up a little bit on what he said, um, the website for Ready to Work now is readytowork.apsa.africa. Whilst you're on here, just go on there and then check out the numerous you know, possibilities available to you. Uh, APSA is taking it upon itself to ensure that they equip entrepreneurs with the prerequisite skills to be able to survive in this age of entrepreneurship. I mean, the world is moving very, very fast. And for you to be able to catch up, you need to equip yourself with skills that are freely available you know, on platforms like Ready to Work by APSA. Um, this next one has something that is very, very important. I mean, it's, um, it says, how do I... Okay, what advice do you have for Ghanaian? Okay, all right, let, let's move off that. <laughs> um, okay, so question to Amaya Debra, right? Let me just go off that question. Question to Amaya Debra, what are your thoughts on social media influencers, those that display nudity on social media? <laughs> so uh, my thought is, I think, especially when people are signing people to do things for them, they should know the kind of person they are. I mean, if somebody is pushing nudity, there's, there's clearly market things that. that should follow that. Mm. But if you are a bank and you are now going, then, then you are sort of mi missing the mark. And uh, I keep telling people to know what exactly they want. And it's not always about the numbers. Yeah. Because the numbers don't always push, uh, uh, like, conversions mm. and so every campaign should look out for specific things and uh, I have had successful campaigns I've had some that have not been so Super successful, successful yeah. uh, but uh, what I offer is at least even if it's not if it doesn't have the conversions people get to know about it mm. and that is like the least I'm offering because I have the platforms and I try to give it a voice so yeah. that people uh, would at least mm. pay some attention to what you're doing. They may not end up uh, buying or going for the product in the end, but it gives them that knowledge that this exists. Uh, and I keep saying that's the, the minimum I can offer. The awareness anybody. alone. The, the awareness alone. The is awareness fine. alone is fine. But sometimes the conversion matters, mm -hmm. and we should uh, we should build our our network, our audience, so that they are aware that. Uh, this is what Amiya does, yeah. uh, and so when push comes to shove, there's someone, at least one person in there that n I can sell to. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I'm just posting popular things just for popularity, everybody is there to have fun. And when you post something that you need that engagement, they may not give it to you because you've you've treated you've you, you've catered to their need for just the fun and not other things. So I try to leave my platform is very it, open. Is it right if I say, sorry to interrupt you, is it right if I say try and build, consciously build a niche market? Yeah. It is very, it is very important. Again, what I do on Twitter is different from what I do on, on, on my Instagram. I've, I'm using my Instagram more for uh, to sort of curate the things that I really want to be mm. a part of. Mm. And sometimes uh, just to put some people off because I don't want to even pr promote what they're doing. I'll charge them higher so that they'll be like, oh, wake can now, and then they'll go, and I'll have my peace of mind. <laughs> I wouldn't post it anyway. But that is, it's, it's being in control mm. uh, and giving the people what you want to and not letting them lead you into giving them what they want all the time because then you, don't, you are not in control. Uh, and it may not always give you the numbers if you're in control mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's important uh, that you should be in all control. Right. Alright, thank you so much. Uh, for the sake of time, we might have to wrap things up 
Final question goes to you, Nana. It's addressed to you. It says, please, can you elaborate more on your second point of ways to stand out in the tech space? Briefly, I think you gave a point that yes. he wants you to... So I think uh, my answer initially to that was specific to grow for me. Mm -hmm. But generalistic, in a, in a general answer, whenever you want to stand out, you don't stand out for standing out sake. Mm -hmm. You have to, to a mere Deborah's point, you have to have clarity on what you are pursuing. Mm -hmm. And I think standing out is a variable of what your destination is. So um, everybody gets into a bus from Accra on VIP to Kumasi. But people don't go to the same houses, right? They all go to a particular house, yeah. because, and that's their destination. Mm. So technically, everyone on the bus stands out. Mm. So the question really is, what's your destination? True. If you don't have your destination clear, then you are not going to stand out. Then what happens is that you get out of the VIP bus, you follow this guy. You, are, you, know, you, you know, have you ever had this experience of you're going somewhere and you, you know you're not too sure of the road, so you just start following a car just to get to a dead end? <laughs> Yes. So first of all, it's your destination. Mm. Second, after you have defined your destination, you have to have a clear plan to your destination. Mm. Because what's going to happen is that your plan or your journey to your destination is what you call your story. Mm -hmm. So Amaya has a story. Ebo has a story. I have my story. So you have to plan. Sometimes it doesn't go as your plan, but because you have a plan, it guides you. The second thing is that you have to have a big appetite to get to that destination. Mm. Because sometimes people say, okay, I want to be great. How great? A million dollar great or $10 billion great? It's not clear. I just want to be great. I just want to have a business. It's too ambiguous. Have a clear, a specific thing that you want to achieve. And then the final, final thing is that you have to be ready to work hard. Mm. Because everyone who stood out really worked hard and worked smart at the same time. There's no, very, there's no um, sustainably successful person who has not worked hard. So um, these are the four points. Clear destination, um, clear plan, hard work, and an appetite for something big. Mm. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, it's been an interesting day. Yeah. Um, I wish we had more time to go in for some more, but uh, we just have to go. We we'll have some more coming up, guys. Uh, final words. Anything you guys would like to add, a mail? Anything we didn't touch on? Well, I mean, I mean, for anybody who is going to something, uh, my advice is that you start small mm. and then you grow it. Sometimes our ambition can be very big, and then yeah. it ends up deterring us and and, and all of that. So I keep telling people, do it uh, small because you really don't know where it's getting. And if you are spending energy resources, you must control it in such a way that you don't sort of expand all of that and then uh, you, you come to a, a knot. So that is my advice to people uh, who want to do their own sort of uh, businesses. Ebo? Well, there's, there's two points I'd like to close off with. Uh, the first, uh, and allow me to start with a quote, uh, is by uh, an American businessman and futurist. Uh, his name is Alvin Toffler. And he says that uh, uh, the, the illiterate of the 21st century mm -hmm. will not be those who can't read and write, but rather those who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. Mm. Okay? And for me, this is important because we are in an age in humanity where things are changing and moving so fast that if you don't update and upgrade yourself, if you don't upgrade the knowledge you had yesterday, you will find yourself still and irrelevant very quickly. Mm -hmm. So to the budding entrepreneurs out there, to the young entrepreneurs who have already started, indeed for those even experienced ones among them, it's important that you're continually learning, as Nana Sorry. said earlier on, yeah. and renewing yourself, making yourself relevant or keeping yourself relevant. So that for me is very, very important. Uh, I read somewhere that uh, you know, the best CEO in the world uh, read something like 60 books a year and I was blown away by it wow <laughs> such knowledge mm -hmm. uh, but that is what you need in order to understand the various angles yeah. that the world is throwing at you the second is around digital and it wouldn't be it would be remiss of me not to say yeah. something on yeah. digital <laughs> if I'm here uh, which is that the technologies that we use are just enablers True. Right? They're just enablers. And, and these enablers themselves are changing all the time. The real win is up here, is in the mind, is in the mindset, and having the right mindset to approach the, the, uh, a rapidly changing world. Uh, and I would encourage you know, our budding entrepreneurs to always have that uh, at the forefront. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Nana? I think um, what they both said is what I just want to reiterate. <laughs> so you retweeted it. Right? Yes, I want to reiterate <laughs> that. Learning and unlearning. Mm. And I think the best way to learn 
and and this is very very important mm -hmm. is to go the scripture actually says goes to the the warriors who've put down their shields those who've gone through the experience yeah. so the best way to learn and actually to save time beyond the phone that i keep referring is to go to people like Ebo or any executive at a very large organization in position yeah. and to go prepared with very specific questions you want answers to but what that does is that Ebo has over 30 years of experience so when i talk to him his answers <laughs> is given me the answers is given to me is 30 years yeah, of experience exactly. answer. There's no way you can buy that. It's to the test of time. And Ebo went on to say read. When you read, what you have is that you have an, someone like maybe Ebo, or he mentioned Tafla, or maybe any other person writes a book. What, you, what they do is that they put their years of experience into a small book that allows you to learn what they've learned. So reading, like he said, is super critical. And I know a lot of people may find it difficult to open pages. So why don't you then go on an audio book where you can just listen? Because now reading has changed. At first, a lot of people used to have books. But once you go to maybe a guy called like Strife Massey, US Facebook page, and you start reading his stories on his page, you're literally reading books of his life, yeah. reading on Facebook. And then the final thing is technology. He said something important. Technology is like an amplifier. Many of us know an amplifier. You put it in and it makes it loud. Mm -hmm. That's what technology does. So by technology, our conversation here is not available to anyone across the world. Mm -hmm. So before you get onto technology, like he said, you must really make sure that whatever is coming from here is very clear, precise, and of value mm -hmm. so that when it's amplified, people don't go like, ah, this guy, he doesn't have any value. Let me move over. Like, wow, I want to hear more of him. Like, everyone goes back to my Deborah's speech. That is what you want to do. So it starts with yourself. Invest in yourself. Invest in your mind. And when you step out there, by God's grace, you really make an impact. All right. Thank you so much. I picked two things, clarity and precision. I feel if you put these two things to book in all the stages, your planning, your execution, into looking into the future of your business, precision, clarity will definitely take you there. But one thing that can actually I'll take you to the next level is Absa's Ready to Work platform. Right now, you have the opportunity to log on to www readytowork.apsa.com. All the information is there. We're basically here because of that. Any, uh, anything else you want to find out about Ready to Work, how you can equip yourself on the topic that we just discussed, the previous ones, is right there on the website for you. Also, all viewers who are registered uh, on the platform or registered for the webinar today will also receive an email that is going to re-register them onto the Absa Ready to Work platform. And so, from time to time, anything that we have to do, anything that has to do with ready to work, you get notifications on there. So kindly do bear with us. When you get the emails, do comply with them and then join us anytime the platform is on to discuss your future and my future as well. Thank you so much. My name is Eskin. Uh, they call me the Rev. A big thank you going out to our panelists, Amaya Debra Ebo and then Nana Juman. And of course, to you for making time off your busy schedule to join us. This is Ready to Work powered by APSA. That's Africanacity. Thank you and have a wonderful day.